സിന്ദൂരാരുണ വിഗ്രഹം തൃണയനാം മാണിക്യമൂലിസ്ഫുരത് താരാനായകശേഖരാം സ്മിതമുഖീമാപീതവക്ഷോരുഹാം പാണിഭ്യാമലിപൂർണരത്നചഷകം രക്തോത്പലം വിഭ്രതീം സൗമ്യാം രത്നഘടസ്ഥരക്തചരണാം ധ്യായേത് പരാമംബികാം ധ്യായേത് പത്മാസനസ്ഥാം വികസിതവദനാം പത്മപത്രായതാക്ഷീം ഹേമാഭാം പീതവസ്ത്രാം കരകലിതലസദ്ധേമ പത്മാം വരാംഗീം സർവാലങ്കാരയുക്താം സതതമഭയതാം ഭക്തനമ്രാം ഭവാനീം ശ്രീവിദ്യാം ശാന്തമൂർത്തിം സകലസുരനുതാം സർവസമ്പത്പ്രദാത്രീം സകുങ്കുമവിലേപനാമലികചുംബികസ്തൂരികാം സമന്ദഹസി തേക്ഷണാം സശരചാപാശാങ്കുഷാം അശേഷജനമോഹിനീം അരുണമാല്യഭൂഷാം വരാം ജപാകുസുമഭാസുരാം ജപവിധൌ സ്മരീതംബികാം അരുണാം കരുണാതരംഗിതാക്ഷീം ധൃതപാശാങ്കുശപുഷ്പാണചാപാം അണിമാതിഭിരാവൃതാം മയൂഖൈരഹമിത്യേപ വിഭാവയേ ഭവാനീ നെക്സ്റ്റ് നെയിം റിഫേഴ്സ് ടു ദ ഡിവൈൻ മദർ ആസ് സമയാന്തസ്ഥ ഷി ഹു റിസൈഡ്സ് വിദിൻ സമയ and samaya has many meanings in the scriptures the ones that are meant here in this context is the correct conduct the worship and meditative conduct that is in line with ethical virtue there is also there are also many other kinds of worship where people think that they can do strange things um, you might have heard about these things in india where people sit on skulls or do strange kinds of things but the divine mother lalita tepasundri is only approached through virtuous conduct virtuous meditation thus if you want to have some attainment of her sadhana you have to first fully establish yourself in virtue and we will do the meditation on her at the end this time she resides in the mooladhara chakra Mooladhareika nilaya. There are six main chakras in the body, beginning with the Mooladhara chakra, which is the root chakra at the base of the spine, the next chakra being at the base of the genitals, then the third chakra is at the base of the navel, just below the navel, then the next chakra is in the heart, at the center, and then the fifth chakra is here at the throat and the sixth chakra is here between the eyebrows sometimes people speak of seven chakras but the seventh is really the chakra beyond the six chakras there are other systems though nowadays people are fixated only on the six chakra system this is because there was a text around 1800 sorry 800 years ago um and this text is known as the shat chakra nirupanam the description of the six chakras and ever after that text people began to speak about the six chakras but before that there were different systems of chakras some yogi spoke of five chakras some spoke of four chakras only um in the tibetan uh, meditative systems which are very powerful there are only four main chakras sometimes also five and of the four three are main 
heart, throat, and hear. And often is it, it is said that one should not meditate other than on these three. So there are, there are different systems of chakras. So don't be so fixated only on the six. There are also systems of chakras where there are 14 chakras, for instance, that above the sahasra, that there are other chakras in our subtle body. So it's, it's all a question of which system and for which purpose also. Now the Muladhara chakra is the chakra of the earth. This is also why it is, it is known as the root, the basis. Adhara means basis. And in this chakra, so-called sleeping is the energy known as Kundalini. It means the coiled energy. The yogis, when they practice deep yogic exercises, experience this energy at the base of the spine and how it can, it can wake up, so to speak, and it can produce certain effects, which in the beginning are pranic effects. They are effects of the life energy in our body. So sometimes people feel certain energies rising through the spine or descending through the spine and or then they see colors or they feel certain pressure in the body and other things. And they, this is often mistaken to be Kundalini, but it isn't. These are just precursors of Kundalini. And the Muladhara Chakra, where she resides, we call her a she because it's a sort of a, it has a feminine energy to it. This has four petals in its description. It's like a lotus that has four petals. And these four petals represent the directions of the earth. So north, east, south, west. And in its very center resides Lord Ganesha and also Lord Indra, who is said to ride upon the Airavata elephant. And this is very symbolic because Ganesha is very down to earth. He is not a very space-like or windy or energetic deity. He's very down to earth. Thus, sadhana begins with Ganesha in many um, practice traditions, especially the Srivitya tradition. We begin practice with Ganesha so as to gain a certain stability. And only once we have that stability, do we move on to other practices. In order to rise up from the Muladhara Chakra, the Kundalini has to break through a knot, which is known as the Brahma Granti. This is the next name, Brahma Granti Vibhedini, she who pierces the knot known as Brahma Granta. And this can be understood as a kind of blockage that keeps the Kundalini pressed down and does not allow her to evolve through our spine, through our nerve system, nadi system. And the Brahma Granti is related to Icha Shakti, the energy of desiring and wanting, which of course also is the energy of creativity. It's the energy of, of desire, which produces results when we engage in it. But on the spiritual path, desire almost always leads us astray, unless it is desire for something very auspicious, known as Shubhecha, the desire for liberation, the desire for others' benefit, and the desire for our true freedom. Those are known as auspicious desires, desires based on compassion and wisdom. And all other desires are really not so beneficial. And they have to be 
dissolved. And this dissolving of desires is known as the piercing of the Brahma Granti. So, in other words, if you truly wish for your Kundalini energy to wake up and then to flow upward and to turn you into an enlightened being, you have to begin by reducing desires. How do we do that? By simply observing how they are not really useful, observing how constantly wanting something more, always being dissatisfied leads nowhere. It's always going to be a temporary attainment and then some new dissatisfaction will come, 100%. So when you observe this again and again, then slowly your desires reduce and diminish by themselves. Don't suppress desires. Shri Krishna says, Nigraha kim karishyati. What will suppression do? Nothing. Don't suppress desires. Rather, understand. Let us understand that desires don't lead to permanent satisfaction. They only lead to temporary, momentary satisfaction. Not even that. I'm really totally finished with samsara in some sense. I have almost never seen, this is now shocking for you, but I've never seen a single desire that produces an actual state of contentment. I wonder if any of you have really encountered, if you're truly honest, truly, fully truthful, have you really ever seen a desire that produces a state of contentment? If so, Please let me know. I haven't. So, by again and again observing that the very nature of desire is dissatisfaction, slowly desires diminish of their own accord. You understand? So it's not about suppressing them, but rather about understanding their nature. Yes? Then the Divine Mother, once she has pierced through in the form of Kundalini, through the knot of desires, once we have dissolved desires, she can rise up to the level of the navel. And there she is known as Manipuranta Rudita, she who emerges or arises within the Manipura chakra. This is the chakra at the level of the navel. And here, if we have real yogic instructions, which have to be obtained from a real master, a real yogic practitioner, there are certain secret methods of meditating on the Kundalini in that chakra. And these produce tremendous heat in the body. So much so that great yogic practitioners can produce so much heat that others can feel it in their presence. I have seen this with someone. Or they can even warm up their body so much that in the snow or in the cold, they don't need to wear much. I've seen this myself. And that is just a side effect. That's not the main point. That would be uh, silly, of course, if that would be the main purpose. It's just a side effect, but the main purpose of that is to generate an inner fire that is always blazing, always blazing. And this fire then consumes our karmic patterns, it consumes our neurotic th thoughts, it consumes our emotional trauma from the past, it consumes our karmas. The more we meditate on this fire, the more it blazes, it consumes everything. And thus we can just relax as yogis. We can just relax back and let this fire do the job. Something very amazing. And I can only inspire you to 
inquire deeply into the spiritual path and not to just remain on the surface. And here she breaks through the what is known as the Vishnu Granti. Vishnu Granti is the knot of bliss and knowledge, especially. So when this knot is broken through, one gains tremendous accomplishments, siddhis. And the yogic masters and the scriptures, they warn practitioners to be very careful of these siddhis. Because you see, it's very tempting when you can know the minds of others or when you can project your, your thoughts somewhere. It's very tempting to play with that. And when your karmic emotions, your deepest emotions are not yet purified fully by this fire, this ultimate fire of Devi, then your siddhis will in combination with jealousy, envy, lead you into very strange paths. I'll tell you a very personal story. I, I knew someone who really had siddhis, but this person also had a lot of envy and jealousy. And those, when you became the target of that person's envy and jealousy, you could feel the siddhis almost like weapons being, you know, being thrown at you. It's a true story. I'm not making it up. And that is when I understood that the ancient scriptures warn that when we attain siddhis, but we haven't purified our emotions, there is a danger even of becoming demonic, becoming like a demon, using these superpowers or supernatural abilities for selfish emotions. Very, 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 very dangerous. So as sadhakas and sadhikas, we should stay away from all that. And only when our heart overflows fully with absolute wisdom and compassion, should we allow those siddhis, those powers, to do their work, but not for our ever for ourselves. Rather, just the wisdom of Devi flows. And then if we have to know something about someone to help them, that is all right. But never in a way, all right, I'm going to test my power, whether I can know the state of Devika's mind or the state of Bal Mukunji whether he has just eaten his dinner or whether he is hungry or... You, you see, it is all to no purpose. And then, when she further rises the Kundalini energy, which is Devi, it's the Divine Mother, it's our true nature. When she further rises, she pierces up to here and resides in the Agnya Chakra. And that is a very high attainment. It is said that very few people really reach that stage. Surely there are many who think they have reached that stage. There are many who pretend, but the reality is very few, very few. And at this level, one really becomes almost all-knowing. It is the state of Buddha just before he attained full enlightenment. When one pierces beyond this, it is full enlightenment, full perfection. But already to have your Kundalini Shakti rise all the way to Agnya Chakra is almost a state of enlightenment. It's almost a, a state of full realization. Sri Ramakrishna describes how this works, that she jumps up through the chakras and then when she reaches here, there is no duality. He says it's all duality vanishes. And one realizes that 
this mysterious world we live in is just an appearance within consciousness. And it is an ocean of consciousness, an infinite, boundless ocean. Our Swami, Swamiji Omkarananda, he describes this also. It is like an ocean of boundless presence beyond time, beyond space, beyond any physical limitations. And it is utmost bliss, all pervading bliss. And then when she pierces the final knot, which is known as the Rudra Granthi, and this is the knot that is related to the energy of action, the energy of karma, always needing to do something. If you observe your mind right now or your body, you will see it always needs to do something all the time. Either it is breathing or there's something going on in the body, some vibrations, or the mind is jumping a little bit. Even when you can meditate quite well, it's still moving a little bit. Very rare that it is totally quiet. Very rare. Always moving, always doing something. So this final knot pierces through karma. And then comes the Sahasrara, the lotus that is said to have a thousand petals or there is a thousand, a wheel with a thousand spokes. It is filled with rainbow light. It is like a rainbow. And when she reaches there, then she lets the nectar rain down. This is very secret. These are very secret processes, yogic processes. They are known to great practitioners. And you have to go very deeply into sadhana so you get access to these secret techniques and secret processes, the knowledge of these processes. So there is really an experience that happens when Kundalini reaches all the way up here, then the nectar is rained down through all the nadis, all the chakras, everything is filled with nectar. Sudhasara Bhivarishini. And then the whole experience of yours is just pure nectar. It doesn't mean experiences stop. There is a state known as Nirvikalpa Samadhi where there are no experiences, but then there is also after that, there is a state known as Sahaja Samadhi where experiences continue and the world is an ocean of bliss, an ocean of rainbow light, an ocean of nectar in all the directions. And then for you, as a yogi of that level, there are no ordinary beings anymore. All beings appear as deities because all beings in their true nature are deities. So when you reach that level, maybe not in this life, but you should make aspirations for it, that you reach it in the future. It's very auspicious. May I reach the supreme state for the benefit of all others. May I reach the supreme state. Very auspicious to wish like that. It's a sadhana in itself to have such an aspiration. A further description of Kundalini here is that she is radiant like lightning. She resides upon the six chakras. She is the great energy. She is Kundalini. She is fine and delicate like the fiber of a lotus or like a thread of silk. This is also an experience that one goes through that within the nadis of the body, Kundalini can be experienced as as soft or as fine as the thread of silk. She is Bhavani, the energy of Bhava. Bhava is Shiva, 
pure existence. Bhavani is the energy of pure existence. And she is attainable through meditation. Nowadays, everyone talks about meditation, but very few actually do it. It requires a lot of dedication. We can't just expect for these things to happen if we don't practice deeply. I know that with such a message, one can't become famous or one can't reach thousands of people with such a message. I'm very well aware of that. But it's the truth. The truth is, without very committed, deep sadhana, these things don't happen. Would you rather someone told you the truth? Or would you have someone who speaks very flowery words and is not telling you the truth? You see, I could say wonderful things and praise all of you and all that. But the reality is that it takes a lot of sadhana. You have to become a yogic practitioner for these things to happen. Why wait? Why let your life pass away? And then perhaps in older age you think, what would have been had I practiced these things? What would have happened? if I had become a yogi or a yogic practitioner rather than only an ordinary employee, an ordinary worker, an ordinary doctor, ordinary financial expert. All these professions are not in contradiction with practicing the yogic path. They're not. But it requires deep commitment. She is the axe that cuts through the jungle of samsara. This wheel of birth, old age, disease, death is really like a jungle. You don't find your way out other than through the energy of the divine the Supreme Consciousness. She loves auspicious things and she grants auspicious things. Thus, when you generate auspicious wishes in yourself, auspicious aspirations, such as Maitri for others, Karuna, Mudita for others, that is what she loves then your consciousness evolves. Then it opens up. Your chakras open up. Your inner being opens up. And the Divine Mother, as Kundalini energy, can rise in you. But you have to engage in the auspicious for that to happen. She is herself the very embodiment of auspiciousness. And she confers all fortune, so bhagya, upon the devotees. That doesn't mean, however, that we always get what we want. I have some friends in the UK who are upset because they can't find a partner. By the way, if you know any good partners, please let me know. That's just on a side note. Any single people who are looking for spiritual partners, we should we can create a um, a partnership platform, Sarva Mangala partnership, something like that. I, I'm just joking. No, it is when we engage with this energy deeply, 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 on the highest level of yogic attainment. There is that absolute fortune. That bliss is so powerful, so incredible, 
that it is all fortune, you see. So this, it doesn't mean by engaging with Devi a little bit, your financial problems will be solved, then your relationship problems will be solved. No, no, no. She is deeply in love for, with devotion. She deeply loves devotion. So you have to develop devotion. You can't get around that. She's attained through devotion, through bhakti. Again and again, how do we attain bhakti? Well, how do you fall in love with someone? By first engaging with them. By first getting to know them a little bit. Don't just expect love to be present from the first moment. Usually a relationship, I don't know if you agree with this, where there is love right from the start, doesn't last that long. Of course, there are exceptions. There are always exceptions. That's why the proverb says that exceptions confirm the rule. But isn't it mostly the case that if there is instant love, instant fancying, it doesn't last very long. But if the love grows over time because you get to know the qualities of the person, because you, you get to appreciate the depth or the beauty and the sweetness of the person in real situations, then it is real love. And it's the same with bhakti. You can't just look at a picture of Devi or, and then expect this to be the moment when your bhakti flourishes. Oh, nice picture. Mm. And now it's bhakti. No, 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 it doesn't work like that. You have to engage. You have to concentrate upon her. You have to speak her names, chant stotras, observe what happens in your heart when you connect with her. And then slowly bhakti becomes deeper. And she is even won over through bhakti. She is bhakti vashya. You can control her, so to speak, through bhakti. Not really control her, but she's, she, she's totally subject to you if you have real bhakti. She will be totally loyal to you if you have genuine, powerful bhakti. And she dispels all fear. She is bhayapaha the wife of Shambhu, or the spouse, the energy of Shambhu. Shambhu means the one who brings bliss. Sham is bliss. Bhu means to bring forth. And she is the energy of him. She is worshipped by Sharada herself. Sharada is Saraswati. There's a very beautiful name of Saraswati. She who is as beautiful as the full moon in autumn. She is Sharada. And also, Sharada means knowledge, Jnanam, and Da means to give. So the giver of true knowledge is also Sharada. And the Divine Mother is worshipped by Sharada herself. That is why we say that, that Saraswati attends her on the one hand and Lakshmi on the other side. She's the giver of refuge, sharma. Sharanam and sharma come from the same root. She is the giver of refuge. You have heard me speak in the past about the question of refuge. It is really this question what can we take refuge in if we have only 10 minutes to live? If we know we have only 10 minutes left, please 
time and again, bring this question to your mind. It's a very powerful question. You have only 10 minutes to live. You know with 100% certainty it's going to end. Whom do you take refuge in? You can't tell me that you will take refuge in your wife or your husband. No doubt you will tell them, I have said this in the past too, no doubt you will tell them, I love you so much, I love you so much, or your children, I love you so much, I love you so much. But you'll do that maybe for eight minutes, but then the two minutes come. And then? You know it's going to finish. You have one minute left. For some of you, it will definitely be Shri Krishna. For some of you, it will be your Guru. For some of you, it will be Ambaji, Devi, Lalita. For some of you, it might be Buddha. And then you have 30 seconds left. For some of you, it will be not only Krishna, but Radha Krishna. And then you have 15 seconds left. And then you know, now, right? It's very rare that people die without, without fear. It's very rare. But 10 seconds, right? I'm, I'm just giving you this taste. And then you know, now I need to surrender. That is called Sharma. Then you have to surrender. And then in the Narada Pancharatra, I'm saying this now for the benefit of the Vaishnavas, in the Narada Pancharatra, it says, and then without a moment of fear, at the last moment, one should draw one's prana together here and with the mantra, Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya, or with your Ishta mantra, to draw up the prana and shoot into the heart of Krishna. And that is the final refuge. And this practice exists also in other traditions. But this moment of refuge, if you can find this in your life, then, my dears, you have used your life meaningfully. If till the very end you're not sure and you're still asking the question, oh yes, who knows, do these things really exist? Or um, I'm not sure and oh, I need to overcome all my worldly problems first and then I will start finding the refuge and all that. That is really a waste of time. So you can find it right now the way we did. Yes. So, this is a beautiful name, Sharmadayini. She's also Shankari. Shankara, like Shambhu, is the giver of Sham, happiness, bliss. And she is the energy of Shankara the energy of the one who gives bliss. She is Shri Kari. She grants Lakshmi. She grants prosperity. But don't expect it to be outer prosperity. If you expect it to be outer prosperity, it, it usually doesn't happen because Shri, Lakshmi, doesn't like to be pursued so much. If she comes of her own accord, then it is wonderful but not pursuing her. Shri is much more than wealth. Shri is splendor, beauty, infinite joy, infinite radiance. She is the pure one, infinitely pure. And her face shines like the full moon in autumn, which I already said, Sharat Chandra Nibhanana. Her face shines like the full moon in autumn. Those of you who have been to India, 
during autumn season. And if you have had the fortune of having a clear sky, then you can see that. It is an amazing full moon. Then you understand this name. So my dears, let us now end with this session with the meditation on the Divine Mother. In the ocean of nectar in your heart, Sudha Sindhu, the ocean of nectar. White, radiant nectar in all the directions. It has no limit. It has no boundary. And in its very center, there is the island of jewels. Manitvipa. Living, breathing jewels, diamonds, lapis lazuli, sapphire, rubies, emeralds, but living ones. And in the center of this island, there is the tree, the Kadambavana, the forest of hibiscus flowers, wish-fulfilling hibiscus flowers, with a red beyond imagination, such bliss, just exuding, emanating from this hibiscus forest. And in the center of this hibiscus forest is a beautiful lotus lake, a lake of lotuses. And these lotuses, they represent enlightenment, absolute wisdom. In its very center, there is a most beautiful palace in the form of the Sri Chakra. Filled with many, many, many deities, which are all forms of Devi, forms of Lalita, and representing different energies and aspects of her. And it has several layers, as we pass through the first one. We meet these yoginis, these energies of the divine. And we pass through all the layers step by step. Till we reach the very center. Which is the bindu, the point of absolute reality, absolute bliss, Sarvananda Maya. And here, the Supreme Divine Mother is resting upon Sadashiva, the ever-auspicious Shiva. Her face is 
radiant, like 10 million suns, with the gentleness of 10 million moons. And she has all the qualities and beauty that were described in the previous names. From her side of her eyes, Kadaksha, there are waves of compassion flowing to you. Waves of compassion that seek to transform you from an ordinary state to the state of a divine sadhaka, a divine sadhika. Your heart fills with joy experiencing her compassion. Fills with love. This is bhakti. With gratitude. Then you place beautiful flowers at her lotus feet, flowers of your innermost wishes, your innermost aspirations for liberation, for freedom, and for blessings upon all beings you are connected with. All this takes place in your own heart. And thus you can do this yourself again and again. It is a visualization, yes, but by visualizing, gradually you will feel that there is a real effect. This is what the scriptures say because the mind is very powerful by engaging visually through the jnana chakru, the inner eye of knowledge, by engaging visually, you bring forth something that is actually real. It is not unreal then. You will see. You will feel more and more joy So here we are finished. If there are any urgent questions about the text, please feel free to write in the chat or also speak as you wish. Um, namaste, uh, Ajayaji, it's Ranaka. I, I just want to ask you, um, so I, uh, if somebody's grown up um, worshipping Lalita Sastranam, uh, Mataji, and then uh, they've now, in the past few years, they've come close to, they kind of formed a bond with Lord Krishna. And then reading the Bhagavad Gita, you hear that Krishna is the own supreme Lord. Um, how, how, how do we kind of manage that? Because there's closeness for Lalita, so Mataji, and for Krishna. So... You see, here there are different lineages, different traditions in ancient Sanatana Dharma, and each of them, of course, in order to, to create a true devotion, always states that the, the deity at the center of the tradition is the supreme. You understand? So the, the texts related to Shiva, 
will say that Shiva is the supreme. And the rishis, these are also rishis who revealed those texts. Similarly, the texts related to Lord Krishna will state that, that Lord Krishna is supreme and the state the text related to the Divine Mother will say that the Divine Mother, Lalita, is supreme. In the Lalita Sahasranama, it actually states that she is Krishna. So, how to understand this in a, in a way that can be digested? If you've ever seen a crystal, I, I have a crystal on my shrine, but I don't think I can demonstrate it here. If you've seen a crystal, a crystal can take on any color and appearance according to the angle that it is placed. For instance, if it is placed behind something golden, it will shine golden. If it is placed behind something bluish, it will shine bluish. I mean the other way around. If something bluish is placed behind the crystal, you understand the example. So one of the Texts of the Divine Mother states, That your form is Vishwarupa, your form is universal. And it takes on a specific form according to the the context and the, the condition. And now, my dear, if you have actually studied the Bhagavad Gita, doesn't Sri Krishna exactly demonstrate that with the Vishwarupa Darshana? That all the deities are present in him. Exactly like this text of the Divine Mother describes Vishwarupa. There is the Vishwarupa in the Bhagavad Gita as well. So, if your devotion, if your karma is such that you feel strongly connected to Sri Krishna or Radhaji, strongly connected to Radha and Krishna, then allow that to flower fully. Don't, don't mess you, you know, yourself up by having doubts because Sri Krishna also says, Samshayatma Vinashyati, that if you have a lot of doubts and uncertainties, then you will go to ruins. If you really have that spontaneously coming to you, then stick with that fully. But don't do it in a way of a fanatic. Don't do it like a, you know, like a, someone who says, this is the only truth, because that means then what about the other rishis who revealed all the other beautiful shastras? It's not only the Bhagavad Gita that was revealed. Bhagavad Gita is only one part of Mahabharata. But there are so many Puranas, there are so many scriptures, and all of them, all of them were revealed by the Rishis. And Sri Krishna is the infinite knowledge that revealed these texts to the Rishis. So you see, if we say that the Lalita Sahasranama cannot be as true as the Gita, if as a Vaishnava, we are actually offending Sri Krishna himself because Sri Krishna is the revealer ultimately. He is the knowledge that revealed this text to the Rishi. You understand? Hayagriva. Hayagriva is Lord Krishna. He is Lord Vishnu. So this is the way to see it. But you understand? So you go with your devotion, go with your devotion fully and with full dedication but just don't become don't become narrow that is the solution understand that shri krishna is like a like a crystal that can take on any form and that lalita is also that same crystal that can take on any form very important to to have that absolute vast openness like the sky i hope this was a helpful answer to you Yes, thank you. I'm beginning to understand that is because from what you're saying in terms of Lalita Sasana and then the, uh, reading the Bible with Deepa. So yes, it makes sense. Thank you. Namaste. Lovely. And, and this example of the crystal, as I said, is a scriptural example. It is not, I have not made this up. 
It is a scriptural example to understand the true nature of the divinity is like a crystal. It is not just this form here. You see, that would limit this form. It is like a crystal. It can take on any uh, manifestation that is required for the, the upliftment of you, the sadhaka and sadhikas. So here we are finished for today and we will continue. I hope that this approach works well where we go to the essence of the name. In the beginning, I also went into very nitty gritty details, but um, sometimes the essence is more enjoyable than outer details. The same way that when we want to drink the anar juice, what is anar in English? Um, pome pome pomegranate juice, which is very healthy, by the way, and um, Anar is very close to, to the Divine Mother as well. Then when you drink the Anar juice, the pomegranate juice, you don't want the little bits of the pomegranate seeds to be in your juice. You want it only to be the juice. So that is the approach we will take now and I hope it is agreeable to you. Adios.